I'm Matt Hadfield. I'm a uh, medical oncologist specializing in early drug development and cutaneous oncology at uh, Brown University and the Legoretta Cancer Center in Providence, Rhode Island, and joined this morning by a uh, good friend and colleague, Justin Moser at Honor Health in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, who also specializes in early drug development and cutaneous oncology. And Justin, as we were just talking before, big big news last week with RP1 not getting uh, approved by the FDA uh, based on the uh, uh, Ignite study. So, what are what are your off the cuff thoughts about that? And 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 maybe elaborate a little bit about where RP1 was going to fit in the treatment paradigm for for metastatic melanoma patients. Yeah, I think the decision caught everyone off guard, and it was very unexpected because you know a lot of people think that an FDA review and approval is kind of a one time thing companies, you know, do a trial, they submit a packet, the FDA looks at it and says yes or no, but that's actually not the case. I mean, when you're doing an FDA approval, you actually meet with the FDA before you design the study, before you enroll patients, there's follow-up in meetings along through the whole process, so you can get guidance, because what we never want to do is waste patients' time, right? So we never want patients to enroll on a study that will never get approved because the design is inherently flawed. And so we, you know, the FDA had previously signed off on the approval, on the um, signed off on the study design and all of the things for this study and had been going through and it looked like there was going to be no concern. So for the FDA at the last minute to come back and say, we're not good or we're going to withhold approval because of study design concerns is really concerning because those study designs were agreed upon before we even enrolled patients, before the study was conceived and should have been issues that were caught all along. So it really just shows that there's some sort of dysfunction or discommunication going on in the regulatory process, which ultimately hurts our patients. It you know, hurts the patients who volunteered for this study, hoping for a better tomorrow for other patients. And it also hurts our patients because we were all expecting this to be approved because it's effective where it could have benefited other patients as well. And so I think the news was very shocking to everyone because the normal communication and process didn't really seem to be followed. It was very unexpected. No, absolutely. And, and I think to, to your point, um, and, and for those that maybe don't have insight into this, uh, there are these meetings with the FDA along the way, and 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 they it's, it's not as if you just roll into um, Silver Springs and he, here's the application. And it, it's, um, in it, my understanding is that, um, the FDA's problem with this trial specifically is that, um, I, I guess just to back up, the, the trial was looking at RP1, which uh, is an oncolytic virus, um, and the FDA had a problem with nivolumab not being able to be isolated out as its contribution to the the data that was was generated. Could you speak a little bit about the trial design and then and and maybe just explain how uh, Ivance, you know, had an approval with this same pathway? Uh, really the same patient population not that long ago. And now this is a complete, you know, one, 180 from that. Yeah, so there's a couple of things. So what's been like kind of made public is the FDA cited concerns that the initial study, um, uh, the initial Ignite study, which is a single arm study looking at the RP1 injections with nivolumab in patients with refractory melanoma was not a well-controlled study. And so what that means is they're now saying it should have been a randomized study to have a control arm. But again, that's something the FDA would have had to sign off on before it started. And like you mentioned, you know, TIL got a conditional um, accelerated approval based on the same design just about a year and a half ago. And for those who don't know, with the accelerated approval program, you know, typically you can do a small study, show benefit and get approval. And that is contingent upon a randomized phase three confirming the benefit. So it, the fact that they're wanting a well-controlled study <clears throat> in something they signed off on, on an accelerated pathway that is contingent upon a randomized study in the future doesn't really make a lot of sense. And so that's one thing. And then in the confirmatory phase three study that is ongoing for RP1, they did note concerns about contribution of components, you know, what, um, how much is nivolumab playing alone along with, and, you know, the adequate control arms and stuff like that which are, again, are reasonable things to consider, but these are things that should have been addressed on the front end, not the back end, before we started enrolling patients. And so, and, you know, in both of these studies, or in the Ignite study, you know, that was looking in patients who were previously refractory to PD-1. So the combination of nivolumab, which is a PD-1 inhibitor, plus RP-1, 
you know, none of us really expect a PD-1 inhibitor to work for someone that it didn't work in, right? That didn't really make a lot of sense. And so right. none of us would really expect that nivolumab alone would have the 30 some percent response rate that we saw in the IGNITE study in patients who are refractory to nivolumab. And so um, while it would be nice to get more granular detail about what, you know, each drug does separately, it's also really not a reason at the last minute to say we don't really know. Again, especially because the normal process is these sort of issues are dealt with on the front end, not the back end. Right, right, and and, and you know, for for anyone who who's not familiar with the treatment paradigm for for melanoma or metastatic melanoma, pretty much all cases we do immunotherapy up front, dual checkpoint inhibitors. It's either going to be you know lag three plus PD one or PD one plus CTLA four. But um, in the second line setting, you know, if you're if you're BRAF wild type, I mean, there's, there's really not much, right? There's, there's till, which is, you know, uh, you're one of the, the most uh, heavily um, prescribers of till in the, in the country, but it, it's not, it's not accessible to everyone, right? It's, it's not something that everyone can get. Um, so where do you think the, the lost opportunity is now for RP1 not being approved for this patient population? Cause there's very limited options outside of trials. Yeah, I think, you know, the really the majority of patients who are Peter one refractory probably could have been candidates for RP1. So as you mentioned, you know, frontline melanoma, um, most patients are getting combination immune therapy these days, either with PD1 and leg three or PD1 and CTLA4. And for those who progress, the question is, what do we do? And we don't have a lot of randomized data in the second line setting because up in, you know, most of the treatments that are approved for melanoma are approved in the frontline setting. I think there's like eight different things approved in the frontline setting. Yeah. So there's really no standard for frontline, which means there's even less standard for second line. So we don't have a lot of data, but you're right. For patients who don't have a BRAF mutation, really the options are switching to another checkpoint inhibitor or doing TIL therapy at the current moment. We know we don't have randomized data, a lot of randomized data of combination checkpoint inhibitor after combination checkpoint inhibitor, but there was a retrospective uh, study out of the uh, France that was presented last year. And really what it showed is kind of what we would all expect. If you get either combination, either PD-1 leg three or PD-1 CTLA-4, and you have zero benefit, if you switch to the other combination, it's about a 10% chance of responding. Now, if there's someone who gets a combination and has initial benefit and then lose that benefit, and then we try you on the other one, then maybe it's about a 25 to 30% chance of working. Still, majority of patients don't respond, but you know there's hope. So really for those patients who are PD-1 refractory, who have zero initial benefit to immune therapy, we really need options. And that's those patients actually responded really well to the RP1 and Evolumab combination. When you look at the subgroup analysis, they had just as good of response rates um, than as people who initially benefited from immune therapy. So I think most patients would have been great candidates for RP1. Now, when you look at the current kind of TIL landscape, not everyone's a candidate for TIL. As you mentioned, it's only available at certain centers on the East Coast very readily available. When you look at the West Coast, there's not a lot of centers outside of the absolute West Coast, you know, in between the Mississippi River and, you know, the states that lie on the ocean on the West Coast, there's not a lot of TIL centers. So most patients don't have access. Plus, TIL is a cell therapy transplant, right? When means it requires high-dose chemotherapy, it requires high-dose IL-2. And so just based on that, not everyone's a TIL candidate. And, you know, I think most patients over the age of 70 probably are not fit enough to get TIL without being significantly harmed. And even if you are fit enough for TIL, as with all cell therapies, there is a transplant-related mortality. When you look at the data of RP1 and compare that to the data of TIL, we see similar response rates, just over 30%. For median progression or median overall survival for TIL was just about 14 months on the most recent five-year follow-up that was presented at ASCO. In the IGNITE study of RP1, the median overall survival wasn't reached because 60% of people were still living at two years. So you can't always compare trials head-to-head, -head, but it definitely doesn't look like anything is worse than TIL right now. So 
it's really disappointing because I think RP1 could have benefited more patients, especially those patients who aren't candidates for TIL or don't have access, which is unfortunately the majority of patients with mel refractory melanoma right now. Right. And, and yeah, no, so many good points there. And I mean, for anyone uh, with melanoma, I mean, for TIL, you have to have the, the, the performance status, the ability to get TIL to your point, you're undergoing a transplant and you have to have the resources and the support system to go get TIL um, where RP1 is, you know, the toxicity profile is very favorable. Uh, it's an injection. It can be given, given at lots more centers. And the, you know, the response rate to your point is, 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 is similar to TIL. Um, and, you know, it, I also think one thing that, that I was disappointed with, with the, with the um, trial being, you know, resulting in the, the outcome from the FDA was if you look at mechanism of action and, and you know, TIL or um, RP1 is an oncolytic virus. So the idea here is that you're, you're going to be stimulating an immune response in a tumor that was otherwise refractory to checkpoint inhibitors. So there's a lot of rationale that you could resensitize to a PD-1 inhibitor like nivolumab, which to me makes mechanistic sense. Um, Trying to isolate out what nivolumab is doing, I mean, we 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 again, you can't you can't do much off retrospective studies, but even dual checkpoint inhibitors in the second line setting to people who repeat one refractory is like less than ten percent. So I mean, it, it really seems like a lost opportunity to me uh, to give greater access to patients who um, who otherwise could have benefited from this therapy. I agree, and the other thing to remember is RP one is new and novel but it's not the first virus approved, right? We know that TVEC, which was approved, I believe back in 2014, is effective for patients with melanoma. Now the difference is with TVEC, you can only inject superficial lesions, which is the minority of patients, and you can only inject up to four milliliters. And we know from real world data with TVEC that volumetrically, if that four milliliters can cover that entire lesion, you have a really good chance of responding, probably over 50%. If volumetrically you can't, then it's less of a chance of responding. And so, but in those patients who have the superficial lesions where you can inject everything, you know, we can cure patients with refractory melanoma with intralesional viral therapy with TVEC. Now, RP1 is has more viral modifications, which makes it more potent, which I think we've seen in the data that's been presented in the early studies. But also you can inject it into deep lesions like liver lesions, and you can inject up to 10 milliliters. So volumetrically, you can cover larger lesions. So we know that viral therapy can cure patients. We know the limitations on which patients that won't get the most benefit. And RP1 was designed to go around all those things. So there's really good rationale that this was gonna benefit patients. And so it's just really unfortunate that at the last minute, the FDA held, withheld approval for issues that should have been addressed early on. Right, right, and, and um, couldn't agree more. For for patients, so I, I guess j to kind of close out our conversation, okay. what do you think is going to ultimately happen with with RP one? Do you think that they will Replimune will move forward with the confirmatory study and you know in, uh, include the modifications that are necessary to appease the FDA, or do you think there will be a a further appeal process for the approval um, in the near future? And I guess. The, and ultimately, what I'm trying to get at is if patients wanted access to this drug and they were PD-1 refractory in the second line setting, they didn't have a VRAP mutation, um, you know, where, where should we send them? I know we, we're currently enrolling at, at our center the, um, you know, the confirmatory study and we've enrolled patients and, and um, you know, there's still access that way. But what, what would you recommend and what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, I mean, first of all, they got to meet with the FDA, and that's been announced that they're going to pursue a meeting because ultimately the FDA makes the decision if we agree with it or not. And so hopefully that at this meeting, they can figure out a way to get access to this patient, to get patients access to this treatment because it works in a way that the FDA agrees with because you know, really, it's just unfair to pull the rug from, from under patients. So hopefully they can come find a way forward to get this to our patients, either if that's you know, modifying or reviewing their prior decision, if that's tweaking their phase three, if that's doing a quick expansion arm to address some things. But hopefully they can find a way forward for this uh, treatment because, again, it, it works and patients have benefited. Yeah. And, and I mean, and, and there, there's situations too. You know, I have, a, I have a patient right now who has a um, really only disease on her eyelid, a melanoma, has no evidence of systemic disease, but has progressed through multiple lines of, of therapy, you know, adjuvant, and then, you know, first line uh, nevorella. 
And it's like the perfect patient, right? There's something that's easily injectable. The rationale is good. Um, I ended up putting her on the confirmatory study, but it, you know, if this was approved and, and and can be given around the country, I mean, it's a it's a huge opportunity loss if they don't if they don't reverse this decision for a lot of patients, unfortunately. Absolutely agree. Well, no, thank you so much for taking the time to talk. Uh, I I I can only hope that the FDA, um, you know changes course and reconsiders based on past approvals and 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 that this doesn't go the other direction and they start re reevaluating trials that have already received accelerated approval because i think you know that's another thing we were talking about before this this uh started was you know conditional approvals are by nature conditional so um we just have to hope that it, it doesn't uh exclude patients from getting access to these really really important therapies yeah, I agree. I think that's the most concerning part about this decision of the FDA changing their mind at the last minute is, you know, we've talked that the only thing outside of checkpoint inhibitors for people who don't have your mutations, um, who don't respond to first line therapy is TIL therapy, but TIL is currently approved on a conditional on a conditional approval pending a confirmatory phase three. When you go to conferences, the phase three trial of um, till therapy in the frontline setting is far more controversial and debated among the academic community than the RP1 study was. And so if the FDA were to do the same thing, where at the last minute say, actually, we don't agree with the trial design that we approved, that approval would go away and patients could lose access. Additionally, then that also means we've enrolled hundreds of patients on a phase three trial and they volunteered their time and effort to try to move this forward only for the FDA to waste their time by changing their mind, which, you know, hopefully we just can't stand for. We have to all be on the side of our patients, including the FDA, whose role is to protect them. Couldn't agree more. And and, and two things that uh, just popped up while, while you were you were making those those really excellent points. I think one of the things that's really uh, important to highlight here is that when when we talk about confirmatory phase three studies, it's, it's not as if... Um, you know, the, the, now the FDA has gotten better about making sure that they're open and enrolling, usually at the time of the accelerated approval. But it's not as if these studies are going to happen in like three months and then we have our answer. I mean, we're, we're talking about years long studies in, involving enrollment around the country and the world. Um, and again, you're 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 excluding patients that, um, you know, could have gotten this standard of care. Uh, and, and I agree the accelerated approval process probably does need some overhauling. I mean, there's been there's been instances where drugs were had their confirmatory studies um, taken back. But I, I think it, with RP1 specifically, I think uh, among melanoma doctors, it was pretty convincing that this was an effective therapy in a patient population that really doesn't have much. Yeah, but, I agree. You've never seen a 15, 16% complete response rate in refractory melanoma, even with TIL. And so, you know, the data was that good. And it would be different if it was safety concerns or manufacturing concerns, but, but that wasn't the case. It was purely the FDA changed their mind and no longer agrees with the trial design they approved on, which is the concerning part. No, absolutely. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk about such an important topic. I think, you know, um, we should be vocal about this as, as oncologists. Hopefully patient advocacy groups uh, are, are speaking out as well and, 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 and trying to support uh, getting this, you know, overturned so that we can increase access to patients. Agreed.